Hi, Signature Associates and friends. Welcome to the Signature Edge Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping you design an uncommon and impactful career in the business of healthcare. Together, we are making a difference for our clients by lowering the rising costs and administrative burdens associated with great care. Engage with us as we spotlight big ideas to discover an uncommon you through leadership, teamwork, and focus on the healthcare industry. Think deeply, commit fully, and take yourself to the next level of performance. Welcome everyone to The Edge, and we are living on The Edge today as we figure out our technology, but man, I am so excited to be here with you. My name is Mark Mathia. I'm here with my good friends, Chris Woodhouse and Amy Hennings. Chris, Amy, welcome to the show. Hi, Mark. Hi, Amy. Hi, everybody. Hello. Yeah, team, we are hot on the heels of a really cool week because that signature performance, we've been celebrating what we affectionately call Founders Day. Team, how did your Founders Day event and celebration go? For those who are local, we had an in-person event. And on the 22nd, we're having a virtual event. So everybody gets to to really enjoy this, this season. But how did it go for you guys? What was your experience like? I had an absolute blast. It was so much fun to see folks, to be face-to-face, talk, catch up, laugh, reminisce, talk about problems at work. So, you know, it was it was a great time. I had really, really a lot of fun seeing everybody and just being together. Yeah, I really enjoyed the the Steel House. And I know that that venue, I, I mean, it was just special. It's new. If, you, if you're not local, you probably wonder what we're talking about. We have a new venue for mid-level concerts and Signature was able to get in there. And I mean, you could tell the story of that, but was able to get in and have have our Founders Day there. And um, it's it's recently actually the same venue that the Killers played at. Um, and it's just incredible. So we had space, we had uh, people, uh, the food was just excellent. And you know, the coolest thing, Chris, and I don't know if you noticed it, as I was walking up to the venue, Having signature performance in our 20th year anniversary logo all over the street, I mean, I, I got chills. That was really cool. Well, the in-person event was an absolute blast. And I'm really excited about this virtual uh, Founders Day that we get to celebrate. Amy, can you tell us a little bit about the virtual uh, the virtual Founders Day around the corner? Yes, this is our first company-wide virtual party, and it's going to be a party. So Alan's going to come. He said he's going to wear his sparkly bow tie. We're going to all get dressed up and we are going to just party on Zoom like Zoom's never seen. And so and celebrate our 20 years. We're really excited. We're going to play games. Um, Everyone's getting a special who signed up is getting a special surprise in the mail. Uh, Should be arriving early next week. And we are the experience team is all in. We're doing dress rehearsals and practicing and doing all sorts of stuff so we can have party like it's 20 years on zoom 20 years on zoom and actually yeah since the pandemic zoom became a household name before that it was we were face to face so Very it's interesting, interesting. So, yeah, yeah said, this will be our first ever um virtual party so we have a lot of people signed up and i hope to see everyone there and i hope we make really awesome connections yeah significant milestone i i think about uh 20 and i and i thought about that a lot because because in business it, it, it is significant. I mean, I, I always look at like business lifespan, more like a dog's lifespan for every one year, at seven. And so most companies can't get past one. If you get past five, it's rare to get past 10. When you get up to 20, you have a really great sound foundation to go from. And I, I, I always think that's a really neat, uh, a neat number to think about. What does 20 mean to you both? Well, it's interesting you should say that. So Nicole and I are having our 20-year anniversary this July. Wow. So it was fun to be in the photo booth and grab the little 20 uh, icon thing that they had there for taking pictures. So we got a picture with the 20. Uh, and it had a little bit more meaning for us, too, beyond just signature. So 20 is a it's a, it's a milestone year. I mean, like you said, Mark, it, that's a long time. It's pretty exciting to to be part of a company that's been around that long and has the footprint that we have and and the reputation that we have. It's really, really awesome. Yeah, for me, 20 is half my life. 
So I feel like this company has been around half my life. And I think that's really, really awesome. I'm excited for the next 20. Yeah, totally. So when we think about 20 years, we also think about, boy, we've been solving problems in healthcare administration for 20 years. And one of the things that caught my attention is the process of solving problems and, and how we kind of identify and solve problems and um, you both know that I do a lot of work with with some people internally and on the coaching and externally as well, but uh, in terms of coaching. And so this concept of problem solving has really struck me. The other day we were in programming meeting and I, I was talking to the team. I want to throw this idea out there and get your get your impression. But but one of the things I recognized is that one of the biggest obstacles and objectives of problem solving is, is to come up with options. How important are coming up with options for you? Or do you just kind of have an intuitive feel and go? I mean, what, what's it look like for you? And do you find in problem solving options to be a big deal? Yeah, I mean, I think options are key. I, I heard a, a speaker talk about this and they call it the one three one rule. And it was his rule for his team members that if they bring a problem to him, they have to have one three one, which is one problem with three options and one of them's their favorite solution. Mm. And so I think that's just a really fantastic idea so that in a leadership role, you're not just being bombarded with problems. You also have other people working to solve problems and to think through things and make those options. And then, you know, with options, you, you allow for multiple perspectives to choose the right options. Yeah, I I love that one three one rule, Amy. How 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 do options play? I know I know you as a forward thinker, and so you would be the one that I would say exemplifies the problem after the fix, like three levels deep. Um, how important are options to you, and how, how what's your process? Yeah, I think um, when it comes to problem solving, sometimes the problem that people bring you isn't actually the problem. And so you really got to dig deeper. The surface level problem usually is a result of something three layers down. And so I think one thing I try to do is really look for what the root problem is and get that piece solved and really think about it that way. Because, you know, if the problem is, oh, uh, we got scheduling problems, I don't know, making something up here. Well, what's the root? What's actually the the problem? Is it? Someone's not doing their role, someone's, you know, and getting that really cleared up really helps you um, see the true problem that needs to be solved. And then you're actually getting further than solving just the surface problems. In internal communications, a lot of times people say, oh, we have a communication problems. Nah, nine times out of 10, it's a process problem. It isn't a communications problem. It's the fact that you don't have the right process in place. And so I always take people back to what's your process and is it actually a communication issue? Because if the process isn't seamless and the process is clunky, the, no amount of communication is going to get you through that process. That's, I think, one of the keys in problem solving. It's what are you actually solving for? We call that root cause analysis. And we're, the training says you have to ask why five times, right? <laughs> Go five layers deep. What are your five whys? Why is it doing that? Well, why is it doing that? Well, why is it doing that, right? To really get you to that root cause. When you think of developing options as a leader, and, and we've all led organizations in organizations and organizations, how is it you set yourself up to be able to have options? I mean, because sometimes it doesn't seem like options don't just come naturally. And so it takes something else. So what what are some of your tactics to to that you employ to make sure that you can come up with different options? I think it's really handy to have strategic thinkers. Uh, that you can go to and talk to because they naturally come up with those options, Mark, as you know, from, you know, your strengths training, mm -hmm. you know, they, they are able to just naturally see ways to navigate through whatever obstacles might be there. So if it's not one of your strengths, find some folks who have that uh, strength and bounce ideas off them, let them poke holes in things. I think that's a really helpful way to, to generate some and then collect as much data as you can. You know me, I love data. Data helps guide you into which options are the right options to go down. I think options require a lot of creativity. And so if you look at problems as an as an opportunity to be creative, then you will see it less as a oh, bummer and more of an opportunity to go do something really great. And I think the more you can do that, the better you are as a team. 
Yeah, I think that's really wise. You know, we had a, a little problem. This is Shan and I were getting ready to go out for dinner. And and I've noticed we have a little problem. And by we, I mean she. So, um, you know, we won't have her listen to this one. Um, but she has a propensity to leave her cell phone behind. And then it kind of bothers her when it's behind because the kids might call and, you know, she's a she's always on alert to help out somewhere. And, and so, you know, I, I, I kind of pick it up and bring it along. And anyway, we were discussing this and I recognize something in those moments when we're getting ready to go, my wife goes into Uber helper mode. Her mind goes a million places at one time, give the dog a snack, feed the dog, make sure the dog goes out. How's the cat? What are the kids up to? And, and it's in that mind flurry that we often then forget the, the little things and we kind of, kind of move on. So it's not a lack or forgetfulness. It's like overactive brain. One of the things that I think of when I think of those problems, we had this conversation, by the way, is, is this concept of being like very mindfully observant of your surroundings. And so as a leader who wants to come up with options, how do you stay mindful when everything is going, I mean, when your feet are moving faster than your mouth, which is moving faster than your brain, what does it take to stay in the moment so that you can start to generate different options? So first I'll give you an option because my wife has the same issue. Get her an Apple watch with cellular data. Cause then when they leave their phone, which is inevitable, they can still get calls and texts and they don't have to worry about it. But uh, and back to your question, <laughs> I think <laughs> nice. what, one thing that, that is really helpful is don't get stuck in the weeds, right? When you're solving a problem, it's easy to get so focused on that one thing that you forget to take the big picture into account. And while doing that, you might solve whatever problem it is you're experiencing, but to Amy's point, you might create three more in some other avenue that's related or that, that there's impact. So you have to be mindful of the big picture and not just the, the correction that's being made in the current problem, but what will that correction do? What's the ripple effect for the solution? I actually don't forget my phone. So I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> I'm pretty good with my phone. <laughs> um, sometimes problems don't need to be solved. Sometimes if we get um, over activating, and start solving problems, sometimes they kind of work themselves out without you needing to solve it. And so sometimes mm -hmm. I think that's another key is if you're feeling rushed, sometimes they kind of, you not solving it will work itself out. So what do you do when you can't find the solution? You know, you've got a problem, you got to address it, but there's no apparent solution available. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that that's a really good question. I was I was putting a little course together and and something similar came up. And it's like, well, what do you do? Because the natural thing to say is, well, wherever whatever problem you have, you take the next right thing, the small step in that direction. But what if it's there is no next right step? What if you've reached that point where you're almost at the edge of the cliff? And you just, you know, you one more step and you're going to go down into the valley um, and you don't feel like you have an option. How do you do that? And and I think, Chris, the only way to address that is have two paths. One path for those moments when it seems hopeless that can begin to inspire hope again. And I think that's when you have to go back to the very problem that you're struggling with. What is that cliff called? And then simplify the heck out of it, because somewhere along the line, we've overcomplicated something. And so our vision and our kind of what I want to say, our vantage point on the problem has to shift and change a little bit. So I think it's kind of a simple process for me of like simplify, strategize, you know, start and then 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 stabilize. But I think sometimes when you're at that point, when you don't have the answer and that nothing looks good, that you almost have to take time out, give yourself a little space for grace, and then simplify it again. What is the simplest way forward that makes the most sense, even though there are no good options? Um, Amy, Chris, what would you say? That's a tough question. Well, I'd say two things. One, Mark, you're under selling yourself a little bit because I know Mark has a phrase that is everything's figure outable. So he just believes um, that positivity strength, it goes into overtime and there isn't a problem that can't be solved. 
and Mark always, and that's how Mark leads. So that's something that I think Mark's underselling a little bit right now. But I will also tell you, I solve a lot of problems on the treadmill. I, I, my team knows this. I come in with a lot of different ways you can go about things. Um, and I was, my treadmill thoughts, my 5.30 a.m. treadmill time seems to clear my head enough that I can get really, really creative on those unfigurable out, those problems that seem unfigurable, but they are figureoutable if you're Mark. So it's his mantra. Everything's figureoutable. Yeah, I, I agree, Mark. I think all great points there, right? Change your perspective. You're walking off a cliff's edge. Maybe you turn around, there's a road down the other side, right? You were just looking yeah. the wrong direction. But I also think we got to take into account extremes too. Sometimes we we put ourselves in boxes and we don't allow for extreme thinking. And sometimes that's what's necessary, right? Uh, we're using the cliff analogy. Yeah, you're on a cliff. Can you climb down? Yeah, it might be really stinking hard, but can you? Probably, right? That seems like an extreme option, but it might be the right way to go. Or, you know, how did you get up on the cliff? Back Backtrace your steps, right? How did you get to the point where you are? Do you need to start over? Do you need to blow up the whole whatever it is and start from scratch? And, and keeping those extreme options in mind, they they are still there. They, they're not fun. They're not comfortable. But sometimes it's the right direction to go because it lets you either start over with a clean slate or you just overcome something that's tremendously difficult one small step at a time. Yeah, I like that extreme option, Chris, because then it leads us to this. Then we come up with options. We select one. What's the next step in that process? Once you start to execute on an option, how do you best prepare yourself? So we're solving a big problem. We've made a decision. We've had the options and they were mindfully present. And now all of a sudden, how do we know we're successful or how do we know if it's going to work at all? Yeah, monitor and adjust, right? Just because you picked an option doesn't mean you're committed to it for the rest of your life. You got to watch it. Is it working? Are we pursuing the right solution? And if we are, fantastic. If we're not, all right, let's reevaluate. What's the next step? What what new option do we need to pursue? Yeah, if it doesn't work, fail fast, recover faster. Oh, that's so important, Amy. Unpack that a little bit. What do you mean fail fast? Why would you want to fail fast? All right. I think I was talking to Ad producer Addison yesterday. Yeah. I think you can learn a lot about business from volleyball. And every time I watch volleyball, I see business at work. And what happens is sometimes you have a strategy at the net, you kick a side, that's where you're going to go block. That's what you're going to go do. And something could go the other way and you're playing the odds. At that point, you throw the ball back under your net. You say, nice point, And you recover faster. So even though your option and your plan fail, the winners recover faster, fail fast, recover faster, and go. And I think volleyball teaches that so, so well. And I think that can be applied to business. You guys may not know this, but I coach volleyball. And <laughs> there are so many things I could bring into this conversation right now. But you're right. Yeah, I mean, when you watch volleyball, you're watching those in-system and out-of-system plays. And out-of-system play, it's a bad pass. It's, you know, the setter's got to set from far away and the, and the hitter's got to do something else, right? You're, but the concept is you're always wanting to better the ball. So every touch you get, you want to make it a little bit better. And so, you know, to your point, Amy, volleyball is full of great business analogies. <laughs> but, you know, moving forward, making adjustments, you know, keep keep bettering the ball when you make those options, when you make those adjustments. If you fail, what can you do to improve in the next step, Right. Yeah, I think it I think it's really important too because when you both talked about failure both in the volleyball analogy and in, in the business analogies, you know, one of the things I didn't hear in your voice was fear. So is it okay to fail fast and move on? It's much less painful than you think. The reality is is if you let a problem go on for a long period of time, you suffer so much more than just cutting it off at that point. Yeah, it's uncomfortable, rip the band-aid off, move on, right? It's when we let these things fester that we pay a price that is far beyond what we would expect. And it's not just us, it's everyone around that's impacted. So yeah. much better to adjust quickly. That's such a good lesson for myself as well as, as, you know, I don't know about other leaders, but when I've not acted quick enough or I, I've taken a posture of leaning out instead of leaning in, whatever you want to call it, um, boy, those problems seem to stay with you for a long time instead of getting getting rid of it. So that's that's really good. 
Um, Amy, when it comes to to failing fast and and you're dealing with failure, what do you do to make sure you're prepared to do that quickly and to move right on? And how do you talk about it and not be intimidated? Well, I don't know if I'm that good at it, to be honest with you. I don't like I don't like when it all goes south. But I think one of the things you just can't think too far ahead. I mean, that going back to volleyball, you can't think about set point when you're on point 10 you're 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 actually when you're on point 10 you're trying to get to point 15 or you're just trying to get to point 11 and that's the difference when you fail fast you got you can't think about the end of the game you got to think about the next point or the next little milestone that you're trying to get to and that's that's if you can do that you can you can do really really well yeah i really like that so okay now we we've talked a lot about making decisions and a lot of this was hard decisions right and and yet there's a process behind it so as we think about our listeners and we think about their challenges out there what call to action can we offer them so that they can maybe deal with one of their problems this week and get it taken care of what would be the call out here i would say my first one would be expect problems my one of my mantras this year is i'm expecting 10 problems a day so i'm never surprised when i have when a problem comes my way, I'm expecting 10 a day. Some days we hit five by 9.30. That's happened this year. But sometimes <laughs> um, when you're expecting 10 problems a day, you mark it off. I solved 10 problems today. That I think is you're ready for it. And I don't think you're surprised when stuff doesn't go right. It's never, you're never going to have a day without problems. If you do have a day without problems, that means you need to probably find more problems to solve. Um, because that's business is all just solving problems. But that's what I would say. Expect 10 problems a day. Be ready for it. Yeah, and I think I'm going to point back to a couple of things is root cause analysis, right? Make sure you're solving the right problem. And then with your options, pros and cons list, right? Sometimes it's that simple. Break it down to the pros and cons and figure out if the pros are worth the cons. <laughs> so Make the right choices. <laughs> yeah. and, and I would just say this. We all have natural tendencies when a problem hits us. Um, do we do we lean against it? Do we pull out and completely ignore it? Uh, or do we kind of collaborate and lean with it? So against, away, and and together. And, and sometimes it's helpful if your natural reaction is to pull away and ignore it or whatever it is, maybe that's option one. Maybe option two you should just consider what would it look like if I lean in right now and then play that out and then give yourself other options. So then you can kind of do this analysis prior to addressing the problem. So, so I, I kind of think of three ways to think of those problems and maybe give yourself some options in terms of how you'll perceive those and go against your own grain because you could get in your own pattern of how you go about these. And sometimes you need to shake yourself up to make sure that you're showing up the best leader you can be. Boy, we've dropped some truth bombs in this one. And who would have thought that talking about making decisions solving problems could be such a rich and deep conversation. Chris, Amy, thank you for your time. I think we have definitely gone to the cliff's edge on this one. And hopefully for our listeners out there, thanks for joining us. And hopefully you are now armed to go out there and make better decisions day in and day out. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Chris. Bye, everyone. Happy birthday, Signature. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everybody. Signature Performance is the foremost leader in healthcare administration. Your work advancing our mission is transforming healthcare in the U.S. Signature is bringing together the best and brightest in healthcare. Discover opportunities at www.signatureperformance.com slash careers and be inspired to build an uncommon career that matters.